focusing on what our agenda is. Uh, so for today, our agenda is going to re relate to uh, these 10 items. Uh, you'll notice the pre-audit risk assessment, claims data analysis, uh, location-focused audit, specialty-focused audit, soft and hard-coded items uh, that will need to be reviewed. Um, talk about compliance a little bit as far as a checkup uh, in relation to this topic. Uh, can talk about some concerns related to possible outliers and mention some information related to software reviews. Also deal a little bit with policies and procedures and what some follow-up action plans might be. And then take a look at some example rack audit scenarios uh, as we think about all of that. So with that said, let's get started with the first item, uh, which has to do with the pre-audit risk assessment. And this uh, essentially is going to deal with uh, the various RAC issues and other audit issues that your organization might think about uh, in relation to what you're facing. Uh, these items can be found on the regional RAC website, and the information can be helpful to determine your risk uh, for your organization. So, for example, there are diagnosis codes that will be listed there. Uh, for hospitals, there will be things like the MSDRG uh, for, you know, other uh, providers such as physicians, there'll be CPT codes as well, uh, units of service, and other important information that will help you factor, you know, what services uh, you'll need to audit first. And so uh, from the very outset, you know, these will help you to identify uh, where the bulk possibly of your uh, risk might lie. Uh, with that, uh, becomes uh, information that's going to be necessary to determine, um, you know, what type of risk assessment you'll consider as far as what's going to be involved in that with the availability of uh, documentation. Is that documentation uh, adequate for um, the needs for audit? Uh, do you believe that it would be acceptable uh, for the audit as well? Um, are the services that you're providing allowable services? Uh, while they all might have a CPT code or a diagnosis code related to them, are they allowable? Uh, are the services appropriate uh, for the location in which they've been provided? Uh, are they appropriate for the patient's uh, disease, illness, or injury? Um, it, and then, of course, is the reimbursement accurate as well? That's also something that you'll want to determine as part of your assessment. So in that, you might uh, consider also improper payments uh, that happen. And those happen, of course, as a result of things that are not documented appropriately. Um, the services not actually being rendered. The, the services may not be covered at all. And so you'll have to consider coverage policies uh, in that. Uh, possibly the services might not be medically necessary. Uh, if that is the case, um, then uh, those services will need to be reviewed in, in that scope. Uh, if they've been billed inappropriately um, as another service, uh, commonly in hospitals, uh, those line items within a hospital's system, their charge master system, their practice management system, however they're going to refer to that, those services uh, over the years, many times the service uh, description gets changed and it gets morphed. And uh, over time, it can actually become something that no one uh, knows exactly what is being provided or they believe something else is being provided. Um, also accompanied by inappropriate or absent modifiers uh, that would be utilized. And then uh, the consideration for things that might be uh, double billed as well. And so those are all uh, things to, you know, factor in and, and take into consideration. Also, those payments, those improper payments happen when the services get misrepresented as to, uh, of course, the location, the date, the time, uh, all of those different things that, um, you know, have to meet the specs of what has been provided. Uh, if services get upcoded or they're unbundled, and a lot of times people think that these type of things will not happen currently um, because of, you know, so many different types of software that might be helping them. 
uh, with their coding or with their edits and things like that. However, we all know that when software is upgraded um, or when there's mergers of software, uh, there may be a switch of systems, things like that, uh, software can fail and also updates may fail. And so while we think we have the most uh, recent updated information, we actually don't. Uh, if those services are being fragmented um, and separate claims are being utilized for different uh, procedures on different dates uh, when they're not supposed to be. Uh, and of course, under and over utilized services, all of those things um, are, are items that would need to be looked at. And so they help you to ensure that the tests are uh, and services are reasonable. Uh, the integrity of the data uh, helps to ensure they're sufficient, they're appropriate, valid, and reliable. And so, you know, some of those things, um, you know, are, are, are here listed for you. There, there could be a multitude of others that you might think of on your own, though. And so, uh, in ensuring that those are exactly what I said, um, some other items to consider would be, um, you know, multiple blanks or, or zeros um, or unreasonable values that may be found within your system. Um, so those items need to be uh, thoroughly looked at and reviewed to make sure that they're accurate and that th that information is getting reported appropriately. Um, high volume or high value transactions are another focus that you should consider uh, just by virtue of the fact that um, they will often be flagged for audit. Uh, and then you'll want to count, uh, you need to know the count of any uh, uh, beneficiary numbers uh, by beneficiary name and vice versa to make sure that nothing has been uh, duplicated. Um, that's another part of audit that uh, sometimes people don't think of uh, in that respect. And so a count actually of uh, dates of birth, uh, first dates of service uh, by beneficiary name and number are, are things to consider. Uh, their addresses, um, any particular numbers that link back to them, uh, it could be account numbers or vice versa. The uh, count of the claims, procedure codes, diagnosis, because all of those things that will link back to them as well as the total, uh, re the total of the bill, what was paid, and then any liability. All of these things need to be uh, cross-referenced and checked uh, to know for sure that uh, this is the correct data pool, first of all, that you're going to be starting with uh, to begin with your um, audit analysis. So that, that brings us to uh, the second point uh, in our tips, the second tip, and that is how claims data analysis can help you. And so obviously there's a lot of historical claims data uh, that can be reviewed to help you determine those areas of risk. And uh, you can do that in many different ways. You can do it by provider. You could do it by department or specialty. Um, all of those things can help you to find where there might be failure in, in and about the process uh, for your audit. And so, um, you know, for example, in, in a healthcare record request, um, the AHA in their third quarter rack track uh, for 2013 uh, stated that, you know, there was a, a, a requested complex review that ranged from $8,061 to $10,137 in re Region C, um, and Region A had only 500 records every 45 days, but when you total all of these up through uh, the course of time, you're talking about a total of about $5 million in lost reimbursement for organizations that are either being held onto uh, by the rack, held up uh, in, a, in a process of being audited and or possibly even denied later. And so you want to ensure that the correct amount of dollars at risk is being reported, first of all. And so your HIM director, uh, your business uh, office director, patient financial services, uh, your, your CFO, your CO, they, they all need to know what the actual dollars at risk are. And so that can be part of your report in determining of course, you know, what amount of money is at risk and, and how does that impact our cash flow? How does that impact also then our, our audit process and how we'll need to uh, review this? You know, some executives might want to see a complete picture 
of the potential loss as far as the impact that includes dollars associated in the process, uh, dollars that are pending, dollars that are disputed, things like that. And so uh, those are all things to consider. Uh, some of those should include possibly the reason for uh, denials as well. They'll, they'll want to know uh, related to that possibly, for example, at the hospital level, what DRGs might be at risk. And so you can analyze that, of course, uh, on the website uh, for your RAC and uh, ha have that handy and helpful for your HIM people to be uh, focused on for future going forward. Um, and then also those audits that are in appeal. Um, hospitals, you know, have reported in the past appealing about 47% of all their denials with a 67% success rate for many of them, uh, as reported by the uh, AHA, the uh, American Health Association, excuse me, the American Hospital Association. And so uh, knowing that information is also helpful to know, uh, of course, what all of this is costing. And so, uh, you know, I put on here as well, taking a look at some of that CERT audit findings for the Part B uh, for physician data as well. And then uh, considering, you know, what corrective actions you might take as a result uh, once you've determined uh, some of your focus here in uh, your claims data analysis. So next is, uh, this is uh, another tip here, and this is uh, consideration for a location-focused audit. And so um, your location-focused audit would focus on errors by location or service type or specialty. Um, you know, what type of service is this and where would this occur? And so you begin here to find trends that can be helpful uh, so that you can develop some, some action plans related to minimizing that risk. You don't ever totally get rid of risk, uh, but you can only minimize it and determine, uh, you know, what the, the threshold of that risk is and is it acceptable or not acceptable. Um, carriers focus on service types. Uh, such as hospital visits that you'll see listed here, office visits. Uh, they also focus on, uh, you know, DME items. And, and so understanding all of that helps you from the very beginning uh, to know uh, where you might focus your own audit and to determine if you have risk there. Okay, number four is specialty-focused audit. And in the specialty-focused audit, um, you know, it can help you to know uh, what services have a high error rate. And so, for example, here you see that, you know, chiropractic services historically uh, have a high error rate. And it's likely due to the fact that, um, you know, they have little knowledge of the Medicare guidelines for those services that they're providing and or um, they don't have skillful people helping them uh, with the determination of what the code set uh, is to be used, how it is to be used, and what the coverage guidelines are related to that as well. And so looking at other specialties helps to provide insight into those trends and um, also helpful as far as what type of requests uh, with those documentation problems and any of the uniqueness of the codes that would need to be used, what they would be and, and how you would utilize those. Okay, number five relates to soft and hard-coded items. And this, in particular, gets into uh, the issue related to items within the charge master a lot of times uh, in the hospital. Uh, it can also happen in physician practices as well, especially if the organization is uh, very large and uh, has a robust uh, software um, you know, footprint at, at their organization. So soft-coded items are, are uh, spoken of as being those in which the uh, coding staff within the HIM department are assigning, and they're assigning those based upon uh, documentation that they receive. So they could they could be you know things from the emergency department, uh, they could be items from the uh, surgical uh, suites uh, wherever they might be, uh, outpatient uh, suites. Uh, they could be um, you know endoscopy suites or cardiac cath if they've been. Um, you know, tasked to assign those codes. So those are all related to being soft-coded items. Hard-coded items are those which come directly out of the CDM. Uh, they're built into the CDM, the charge master, and so they will have in, in that the code description, um, 
you'll have information as far as the utilization, uh, what units are uh, attached to that, and, and you have to know all of this in order to understand and determine if that information is accurate. It's going to help you to prevent errors uh, and eliminate some of your risk there. Also, if you have automated coding software uh, from possibly your uh, EMR or your CDM vendors, if you have automated software, you'll need to know uh, those items as well because um, that could be a, an impetus for any type of uh, other um, audit risk uh, that would be associated with it. So these are all areas to uh, take a look at to make sure they are appropriately reviewed. All right, number six is just uh, there needs to be a little bit of a compliance checkup, obviously, as you think about uh, audit for uh, your RAC or any other type of audit that's going to be occurring uh, from your providers. And uh, so, excuse me here, we're having a little bit of trouble with the slideshow. There we go. So first thing is on your compliance checkup, you'll want to um, be sure that you're in compliance with all of your payer conditions uh, for participation, that they're all updated. Uh, you need to be reviewing those guidelines, any guidance that they have through any of their online manuals or memoranda, um, any type of other guidance documents that they have provided or can provide to assure your staff um, that they're following the most current guidelines. And this is in relation, obviously, to coding, billing, documentation, all of those things. Uh, determine that your, you know, this helps to determine that your medical record also is complete and that you can verify and authenticate uh, any of that information that you're going to need, such as, you know, who the provider is, you've got signatures that are covered, the dates and times, everything as it relates to uh, that document that is going to be the document that your uh, audit organization is going to be reviewing, whether it's the RAC or whether it's a third party payer. Uh, or uh, some other entity. And so uh, these are simply just, you know, kind of a, a checklist of things that you'll want to think about uh, in determining that you've um, met your due diligence related to that. Next is determining um, if you have any outliers uh, in relation to uh, your organization. And so uh, you could determine that, you know, through some payer profiles, making sure that they're accurate, uh, you know, um, if your physicians are listed uh, a different way uh, than what they're actually reporting as far as their codes, uh, they can be looked at uh, uniquely and differently by your payers. And I'll, I'll discuss that more in just a moment. Um, so if you physicians who are uh, listed as, let's say, um, orthopedics, uh, but they have a subset of skills that they're providing in a different way and they're using another code set, uh, that could throw off payers as far as seeing a high utilization of those codes. So you want to review your utilization rates on the top 25 diagnosis, let's say, or top 25 CPT code, TICPIC codes, um, and take a look at that. Evaluate, you know, the needs related to uh, your payer index um, so that you can kind of build a case, a system case to see how complex, how unique um, your organization and the specialties within your organization might be. And so, um, again, if your provider's profile is listed incorrectly with the payer, that can cause uh, some, some red flags, which are really unnecessary and just need to be, um, you know, updated and changed a little bit. All right, number eight is a review of software. We spoke a little bit about this already uh, with the um, EMR, the uh, coding software possibly, CDM software, but really this is something that you can't overlook at any level um, if you're talking about the hospital organization because there are multiple software programs that are interfacing. Uh, in the physician organizations, there also may be many uh, uh, software programs that are interfacing for uh, the providers to be uh, documenting healthcare results. And so, all of this with the con, uh, congruence of them coming together for coding, billing, reimbursement purposes, as well as, uh, you know, other things that they're mandated to document for quality uh, initiatives and things like that. Uh, you, you need to determine that everything is, 
you know, there accurately, that the software is updated, that it's able to be used appropriately, that during updates nothing has changed that people aren't familiar with and that they can no longer now uh, do a test that they could before. Uh, and that the staff is actually using the software, right? Uh, new updates from software vendors can cause a lot of unintended and inappropriate billing problems uh, that if you don't catch it, that it could cost your organization an audit. And so uh, you'll want to make sure that you, you take a look at that. Uh, you know, I can't emphasize enough, though, the, the need to make sure that your staff are utilizing the software because a lot of times things get purchased and they just don't get used. Uh, and so, again, uh, this is one of those areas that, of course, uh, should be reviewed. And there, there could be so many uh, software programs within the hospital organization itself. Uh, this would take some time uh, to be able to go through and do a thorough and complete analysis of those. Um, you know, and so it's something that probably should be an ongoing uh, routine thing that would happen within your uh, organization. All right, number nine is policies and procedures. And of course, um, you know, this is one of those things that you you never get enough of, really, as far as uh, needing to have them. But uh, are they clear cut? Uh, are they uh, obviously policies and procedures that deal with conduct standards and not just a policy and a procedure, right? Uh, and that there's a mechanism uh, for people to be aware that they need to uh, follow those guidelines, that they need to uh, absolutely be following those and that there are consequences when they do not. So the overall ability of the organization to manage um, and engage their employees with that, um, you know, will, will lower the risk of audits within the healthcare system. And again, just something that uh, should be ongoing, uh, something that would be routine, something that would continue uh, throughout the the life of the organization, not something that ever ends, but is open-ended and ongoing. And then that brings us to uh, number 10 of our tips, and that is, uh, of course, follow-up action plan. And so some of the things that obviously an action plan is supposed to do is to deal with things from your findings, right? So you've reviewed and you've analyzed all of your audit documents now. Uh, you've determined if um, there are issues that need to be addressed that are low risk, medium risk, or high risk. However you decide to uh, put a threshold on those, um, you, you've determined that they're you know, significant, they're material, they're, they could be part of a, a systemic problem with your organization, they could be part of a software issue that needs to be addressed, whatever it is, but you've determined what those are and now you need to take those results and uh, feed them back into your risk assessment and re revise it uh, to determine now going forward, uh, you know, how that will look and, and how that will work. And so uh, once that's done, you're able to uh, now effectively and easily uh, control your key risk. And so you'll uh, finally want to brainstorm with your staff uh, to determine you know, what are the best ways that we're going to be able to do that? Uh, what, do, what does that look like as far as, um, you know, uh, it, does that mean we need to address it with more training and education? Uh, does that mean that we need to address it with, uh, you know, a little bit more internal audit? Um, or is that something that we'll need to outsource if we don't have enough staff or enough time uh, to be able to do that ourselves? Uh, how will we address the needs of those software issues that we found and what might that look like as far as uh, uh, getting those addressed because software vendors it takes time uh, to get them to make uh, any updates and changes uh, to their software uh, if ever sometimes uh, some of them don't make changes for us uh, we simply have to go along with what we purchased many times and so uh, again that's part of what needs to uh, uh, be looked at and thought about and so some of the actions and as far as uh, Follow-up might include, um, you know, introducing some of those controls that are based upon what you've learned. Um, so putting those things in place um, that are going to control the risk and limit the risk. Uh, you'll want to, of course, share those results and any of the revised risks that you found 
uh, with all of your staff as well as the controls that you're going to put in place that they've helped you to develop and so that's something uh, again that that releasing that information and how you're going to share that information will will need to be discussed and reviewed because your organization might be quite large and uh, you know the need to do that and how you'll do that may again take some time and some thought um, you know documenting the changes in relation back to your policies and procedures based upon what you found and you know that will mean updating some of those uh, things possibly in your manuals in your online documentation if you have something set up on your intranet with your organization and then again uh, what type of training and education will this entail and who are the individuals um, that will need that it's possible that everyone won't need all of the education related to this right there'll be some people who you know don't touch the area of risk they're they're not influenced they're not impacted and they're not directly connected to it and so uh, it's possible that they won't need all of the detailed uh, uh, training education as to you know what others might need um, and any of the policies and procedure uh, changes as well so uh, again making that part of something that is uh, routine and whatever routine is going to be for you uh, you'll need to think about and consider and so now let's uh, talk about and think about some different Iraq audit scenarios um, that uh, we might you know discuss a little bit so uh, one of those things are uh, respiratory system diagnosis with ventilator support this is one of those rack issues that you would see on the website in which um, you know they will provide uh, some some information related to this and stating that uh, the reviews have determined that there are inpatient claims that are improperly submitted with respiratory system diagnosis and ventilator support because the principal diagnosis on the claim doesn't match the principal diagnosis identified in the medical record and so you know what they'll have here is um, you know information on the website giving you some DRGs uh, some diagnosis codes um, implicating that you know there are some uh, complications and comorbidities or major complications and comorbidities that were actually present correctly sequenced and coded or not uh, in some of those reviewed and so um, when they provide that data, that information there, um, the, to prevent the delays and denials of reimbursement, the hospital needs to confirm some information. And the information that they're needing to confirm here is directly related back to uh, possibly what the RAC has even shown. Um, so they need to confirm that the principal and the secondary diagnosis codes and the procedure codes on the claim uh, for the various DRGs that they've listed for the topic, whatever it might be in this case, we're talking about respiratory uh, diagnosis and ventilator support, that they all match in the patient's medical record, that it, this is a true match, right? Uh, the principal diagnosis and the secondary diagnosis identified as the uh, CCs and the MCCs are actually present, correctly sequenced and coded, that uh, that information is actually there. And so, uh, again, the condition is chiefly responsible for the patient's admission is what should be sequenced as principal, and then the other diagnosis identified represent the CC or the MCC present during the admission that uh, impact the stay. And so, again, this is one of those items that uh, when you'll see this, it's pretty um, informative <clears throat> that this is one of those things that uh, you'll need to address with your coding staff, right? Your inpatient coding staff, as well as physicians who are documenting the information. Or it could be possibly related to an item with your automated uh, EMR uh, coding software that might be attached um, to your, um, you know, your medical record. And so what the what the coders might be using as well. Uh, that's something again that will need to be reviewed. Hospitals need to consult the benefit manual, the Medicare benefit policy manual, and uh, in doing so, they'll find out more information related to uh, the details of what they're in charge of uh, either capturing as far as the coding, the billing process, and the need to be compliant uh, with the Medicare guidelines. Um, and so again, uh, going back to that manual helps on many of these topics. Okay, so that's inpatient hospital related. Now, 
here's another item that's inpatient hospital related and it has to do with excisional debridement and it's a complex review. And so uh, from the RAC website, you know, this is one of those items that you would find. And so what happens is the hospital coder assigns the uh, procedure code. And in this case, now they're showing us some, some old, um, you know, pre-ICD-10 uh, information here, but 86.22, um, excisional debridement of wound, infection, or burn. And so the medical record note for the physician states debridement was performed. Well, the AHA the coding clinics provide us information as to you know what's going to need to be assigned as far as that um, procedure code, that uh, inpatient procedure code, that ICD procedure code. So uh, again, uh, this is information that the coding staff uh, have to be uh, apparently uh, you know uh, correct on, or else your um, rack is going to be able to ding you and take back money when they find, uh, you know, information like this. And so the RACs have determined that claims have been incorrectly coded on these items when the issues were found. And so they requested, of course, you know, the pay repayment on those incorrectly coded procedures. And, uh, and so corrective actions here, just as a suggestion, you know, that the coding staff along with the physicians have to be educated. They need to be informed about the guidelines, the documentation, of what coding for excisional debridement actually looks like, and then those items that are part of the complex reviews that are found on the website, they should be a precedent in your audit risk hierarchy uh, to help you prevent any type of further areas of um, you know, a risk there in the future. All right, next, this is a outpatient hospital issue, and this one is for excessive units. So this is an automated review, so no one had to really sit down and take a look at this one per se because uh, they used some algorithms, computer program algorithms, to be able to identify these. And so, for example, a hospital has billed multiple colonoscopies for the same beneficiary on the same date of service. And again, you know, you're probably thinking, well, shouldn't our software catch this? Shouldn't our uh, CCI edit software catch this? Or shouldn't there be some other type of software that's catching this. And I would say, yeah, possibly so, there should be, but that means that when these things have gone through and they've actually been found on audit, that software wasn't working correctly. Um, and so again, the need to actually audit the software and audit the vendor. Um, so in this case, of course, you know, beneficiaries uh, should not be getting a uh, more than one colonoscopy per day, according to Medicare, uh, rules and regulations and guidelines. And so the RAC determined that, of course, these are excessive services, they're medically unnecessary, and of course they issued um, requests for repayment. And so again, um, you know, corrective actions here have to do with, you know, some of the workflow processes around, um, you know, your endoscopy procedures and that uh, endoscopy suite, what is going on with the soft coding versus hard coding there, what is happening with any software uh, interfaces, the update of any entry screens, the actual items within the CDM, um, and again, analyzing sample claims data to ensure that those corrective actions have actually, um, you know, taken place and they're correct. So another one, and this one continues to stay around. It's been around for a good long time, but it continues to be here. Uh, and this one is, again, an outpatient hospital and a physician item, and it relates to excessive units. And it's an automated review as well. And it's for a drug product, Nulasta, and uh, the HIPAA code there that you see, they identify it by that code itself. When claims are submitted with the total number of milligrams instead of one unit, per six milligrams, uh, those claims that are submitted with that code uh, represent, you know, something that's going to be off if it's not reported accurately. And so during the RAC demonstration product uh, project and afterwards, hospitals and physicians uh, reporting their claims uh, were found to have had uh, these radio or excuse me, these pharmaceutical items improperly reported. And so they were considered to be medically unnecessary by Medicare. 
And so again, this is something that you can go back to the manuals for uh, you know Medicare. You can look at the processing manual. You can look at transmittals um, uh, throughout uh, you know time going back. Um, you can also uh, you know do a clinical pharmacy a CDM audit to determine that your descriptions within the um, the pharmacy formulary is actually correct, that the units there are correct, correct um, that the multipliers are correct, and then that the multipliers in the CDM are cor correct as well. Now that's a that's a tough one to do. You'll need to engage some people who are thoroughly knowledgeable uh, with pharmacy products as well as uh, getting your pharmacy staff and, and possibly even the pharmacists on board. Uh, but that's something that's ab absolutely necessary. So part of that correction, uh, part of that corrective action is, is going to uh, deal with, you know, any type of staff that are going to be able to help, um, you know, take care of that, um, you know, and, and, and bring it up to speed where it needs to be. All right, and then the last item that we'll look at is specifically physician related, and this one has to do with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and the excessive units being reported on it. And so this one is based off of the uh, medically um, unlikely edit table for practitioner services for this CPT code 99183. So it's only to be reported once per beneficiary per date of service. And so the denials focused on lack of documentation for, first of all, medical uh, necessity, any goals and timelines for the uh, therapy, the lack of uh, diagnostic reports that confirm the diagnosis uh, that they're looking for, that are approved for um, you know, this procedure, and for improvement or the lack of improvement. And so there are multiple things that, of course, they were able to determine that you know, it was not met and as a result, uh, they felt like this was incorrect provided and they would be requesting um, you know, uh, money back on those as well. And so in this particular case then, uh, you know, action plans the need to deal with the documentation of the medical necessity, the treatment goals and timelines, uh, the patient's response to the treatment or lack of response to treatment, and then all of the diagnostic reports which are confirming all of those things uh, that you see above. All right, and with that said, uh, at this time we want to consider uh, any questions uh, that we might receive. And so I don't see any listed in the chat box um, at all. Um, Justin, if you wanted to open up the line for possibly taking some, or if we wanted to just allow um, a email to me for questions, we could do a FAQ afterwards at that time. Okay, Layman, uh, there's actually a, a, some questions here in the questions box. Okay, go ahead, um, and, and if you'll take care of this, because I don't, I don't have it up in front of me. I can't, I, don't, I guess I can't access it for some reason. All right. Uh, first question I'm seeing is from Diana. Well, first let me address, there's a lot of questions about the slide okay. deck and whether it's available. And yes, we will be emailing everyone with a link to the slide deck tomorrow. So everybody can rest assured that you'll be able to get that and download it. Um, so yeah, moving on to the next question I'm seeing. This is from Diana. She asks, for RAC audits, I understand they can go back three years. Is this from the first date of payment? Um, so if you received a payment later at take back and then another payment, it would be the first payment, correct? I believe that is correct. Um, the best thing to do is to uh, review those guidelines at the CMS website and or your RACS website. They'll have those uh, spelled out and detailed for you, but I believe that is correct from the date of the first payment. Great. Um, next question I'm seeing here um, is from Ganesh, and Ganesh asks, I want to know how automation software has become a part of audit risk. So basically what that relationship is there. 
Okay. So, um, so when, whenever we have software that automates processes for us, uh, it takes out the uh, human factor of, of course, you know, seeing our mistakes as we make them and also knowing that we need to go and audit the human who is, you know, doing any type of entry uh, into a system, right? And so if we have something that's automated for us, and so I'll use a, uh, a coding tool as an example. So if I have a coding tool that's helping my coding staff automate a process, so it's, it's looking at um, uh, dictated uh, or, or EMR information or a data file that is imported into the system and it actually takes a patient's record and it begins to assign codes for me, then that's something that will always need to be audited. And the reason why is because it will never be able to, with 100% accuracy, determine that the proper ICD code was uh, assigned, that the proper CPT code or HICPIC code was assigned in the context of what's going on with that patient over the course of their, their, their uh, date of services. And so specifically as it relates to inpatient services, right, where the patient could be an inpatient for multiple days, uh, for months even, um, and so there are multiple uh, codes to be reviewed and to look at. And so no matter how good the software is, it will always need to be looked at to make sure that, first of all, something hasn't been missed, and second, that something hasn't been inappropriately assigned because of the algorithms that they determine uh, should be utilized. Hopefully that makes sense uh, to the person who asked that question. Thank you for the question. Great, thanks. I um, have a, another coding question here from Frida this time. Uh, the question is, is it still true that the HCPCS code descriptions do not always match how some drugs are supplied? Uh, and then follow-up question, do you see this ever being made to match exactly, that is, HCPCS code to how drugs are actually supplied? Yeah, that's. I think that's like a, the, the million-dollar question. Uh, I, I don't know that that will ever be the case that they'll match 100%. And I guess the reason is, is because of the ability for various manufacturers and providers of drug items to be able to uh, provide that at various scales uh, to, within their organizations that they sell to. And so, uh, for example, they could provide them at, you know, various quantities and costs uh, based upon the scale of the organization. So, for example, Cardinal Health is a big, um, you know, provider of pharmacy items. And so, uh, based upon their clientele and who they sell to and the uh, the size of the organizations, they could offer uh, various tiers of product discounts uh, to those organizations based upon what they buy, the history they buy, and how often they would buy it. Because of that, you know, there's no way to know for a fact that they would ever come in line with, uh, you know, what the hick pick uh, description might be. And first of all, the reason is because they haven't been mandated to. Um, you know, they, they're not absolutely required to. But in the case of some instances with Medicaid and Medicaid rebates, you know, there is some things that, you know, oftentimes will get back to that with the, uh, the NDC number, the National Drug, uh, you know, uh, item number. So uh, th th in, th in those particular instances, uh, they'll be as close as you can get. And, and so far, that's what we have. That's what we're going with until something might change. All right, great. Um, also have a couple of questions uh, from different various people, uh, attendees, who would like to know what the difference is between hard-coded and soft-coded. Okay, so again, hard-coded and soft-coded relates to items that the, um, the coding staff within the hospital or the physician organization would actually assign themselves based upon documentation in front of them. Uh, and so, for example, when patients have a procedure performed in the OR suite and that information is sent to uh, the HIM department and so for example a patient has a, uh, a fracture that's reduced in the OR suite the coding staff will assign the ICD codes and they'll assign the CPT codes in relation to uh, what took place on the hospital side right and the on the physician side it's possible that they might do the same thing 
or the, the physicians have chosen the codes themselves. Uh, however, on the hospital side, primarily, that's a soft-coded item because the coders assign that. Hard-coded items are ones which directly come from the department. And so radiology, all of those radiology codes from the 70,000 section of the uh, CPT manual, they're all hard-coded into the hospital system, their charge master. And they get reported when they're checked you know, by the staff that are working in the radiology department. And that code goes to the claim uh, directly from their system. And so that, that represents the difference there. Something that's hard-coded is already there within the system as opposed to something that someone assigns based upon documentation uh, that there might not, there's probably not any direct code in the uh, hospital system for that item. Um, all right, I have another great question here. Uh, what do you do when you disagree with the fi findings from a rack audit? So the, it depends on, of course, how much money we're talking about, what the risk exposure would really be like uh, as far as uh, take back, right, of money, uh, and how, how you want to approach that. So uh, many times people will uh, set a threshold of what the money level is that they intend to appeal claims for. And so if you disagree, uh, you'll want to appeal it. And so there's an entire appeals process that we'll need to, you'll need to uh, consider and go through. Uh, you can, again, read about that on the CMS website uh, at the RAC section there. They'll go through all of the various claim levels and how those can be, uh, you know, responded to. Uh, reaching out to your RAC auditor, though, is, is one quick way, because if they have not, maybe they have uh, not, uh, you know, they've audited you and, and you disagree, possibly because they didn't receive something. If they didn't receive something they requested, uh, you know, that might be part of the problem. So if you can provide that, uh, they will reverse their decision. And so, uh, again, there might be some reasons for the disagreement, which you're, you're not, you know, inclined to know at, at, at that time yet. Great. Um, I think we have time for about two more questions, Layman. Um, this next one is from Christina. She asks, what do you suggest for the timely, you know, quotes around timely, timely documentation from providers? Is this something RAC and or the CMS is starting to look at? So um, a charge has been submitted without the provider signing off on the EMR. Maybe a system issue or not? Yeah, it could be a system issue. Um, uh, that's one of those things that your organization really has to come to grips with and to, to determine what everyone can live with uh, as far as that policy. CMS and RAC have not yet, uh, you know, implemented a mandated timely number, right? So they haven't said it's two days, it's, it's four days, five days. You know, they really haven't said. And so a lot of times people right now have taken to saying it's one, it's three, it's, you know, whatever. Um, you know, you need to come up with the, the level of threshold uh, that fits for your organization and what you're, first of all, able to accomplish right now. And second, determine if there's any type of reason why it's not happening like you think it should be. Uh, maybe it is a system issue that can be, you know, fixed, that can be addressed. Um, but any of those need to, <laughs> excuse me, need, need to be looked at and reviewed to determine what that would be for you. Great. And uh, one last question here, this one from Wendy. Um, do RAC audits also apply to insurance carriers? No, um, RAC audits do not apply to insurance carriers. They have their own audits. So the, they have their own auditing, um, you know, entity within them. But uh, the RAC audit specifically is contracted uh, insurance organizations that the government has, you know, uh, done, they have, you know, put, a, put together a contract with to go after any uh, risk money at, that is at risk for the Medicare trust fund being depleted inappropriately. And so um, it's specifically uh, for hospitals, physicians, um, DME, uh, for healthcare entities that the government has contracted with. So your third party payers have uh, auditing entities within them but they're nothing like the RAC and they're not focused necessarily the same way 
they don't have the same uh, you know teeth obviously as far as um, <clears throat> government authority or anything like that that they're able to uh, go after you with for that but they can you know obviously request their money back if they believe you're wrong uh, they could disqualify you from participation with their insurance plans and things like that uh, so there are things to consider uh, with that as well great thanks for that and yeah I think that's about all the time we have for questions today I want to thank you again Layman for your presentation and I want to thank everybody else for attending as well and thank you for submitting such great questions um, if you do have additional questions please um, email those directly to Layman layman.willis at healthicity.com um, like I mentioned before, we will be sending out a link to the recording of this presentation as well as a link to the slide deck that you can download. And everybody, you can just uh, keep an eye on your inbox tomorrow for that email. And once again, thank you for attending. We'll see you next time.